Today we're talking about another disgraced attorney who ripped his clients off and then took out his family and no, it ain't Alec Murdoch. Today we're going to be reviewing the trial of Richard Merritt. Hello Sofa Squad and welcome back to the sofa. Yes, it's still there and Roscoe's actually underneath it. I thought he was on the sofa and I was gonna say there he is and then I got scared because I couldn't see him, but he's safe under the sofa. And my name is Paul. Now, as we said, or as I said, I should say, I'm not sure who's sitting next to me, but it's just me today. As I said in the opening, we are going to be talking about the Richard Merritt trial. This went to trial semi-recently and he took the stand in this and we're going to review it now before we do get into all that what we need to do is kind of get ourselves on the same page as to who this is and how we ended up at this video so richard merritt he's now a disgraced and debarred personal injury attorney and he took the same path that alec murdoch did and ripped off numerous clients mostly elderly ones though he will disagree on the age he would eventually plead guilty he got sentenced to 15 years now the judge gave him two weeks to prepare for prison richard had been living with his mother shirley she had taken him in in addition to like helping him get his life going to begin with um, but he had to wear an ankle monitor while he was waiting trial and sentencing and on february 1st 2019 shirley was cooking what she thought was going to be Richard's last meal before he turned himself in but instead it would be the last meal that she ever cooked. Richard was accused and convicted of then killing his mother, stealing her car, cutting his ankle monitor off, and fleeing to Nashville where he started a new life but was apprehended months later. And the story that he offered as to why he was forced to do this, a story he was so convinced the judge would buy was next level and absurd and is what we're going to focus on in today's video and now before we jump in everybody let's go ahead and just make a warm sofa welcome for today's sponsor the people who help keep the doors open and the cushions fluffed y'all welcome hello fresh Go ahead and dive into summer with HelloFresh. From chef-crafted seasonal recipes to their new fresh and fit summer menu, HelloFresh brings flavor right to your door. It's peak time for summer produce, and HelloFresh makes sure you get all the best picks all season long. Their ingredients travel from the farm to your door in less than seven days for quality that you can taste. One thing I love about HelloFresh is their pre-portioned ingredients, and they help cut down on food waste, save time in the grocery store, create room in the pantry, and the step-by-step -step instructions make cooking a breeze. And look, HelloFresh is more than just yummy dinners. They have snacks, sides, and more. Simply shop HelloFresh Market and take your pick from a curated selection of over 100 items. HelloFresh gets it. It's summer. We're all busy. We're trying to have fun. We're trying to live our best lives. And HelloFresh wants you to have it all. Free time and fresh tasty food. That's why they take care of the meal planning and deliver the ingredients. So everything you need to whip up a delicious meal arrives right to you. So when you need that fast dinner, don't call delivery. Think HelloFresh. Their fast and fresh recipes are ready in just 15 minutes or less. And it's cheaper than takeout. HelloFresh features quality proteins, fresh produce, and plans for many lifestyles. It's no reason why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Aside from teaching me how to cook, saving me money at the grocery store, HelloFresh has saved me time during the hectic summer months. So go ahead and give them a try, and when you do, let me know what some of your favorite meals are. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code REPORTINGLIVE for my sofa 50 at checkout for 50 percent off plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code reporting live for my sofa 50 at checkout for 50 percent off plus free shipping. Now keep in mind as I always say I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a cop, I'm none of that fancy credentialed stuff. I'm just a guy with a dog under the sofa and a sofa and some opinions on true crime. They're just my opinions. I urge you to do your own research, come to your own conclusions, and talk about it in the comment section below. Now before we get into all the video clips and whatnot and that 
that is how we're going to review this. I've selected some video clips and news clips and whatnot uh, of the trial to watch and where I'm going to make commentary on them. Now you can view this in its entirety on Law and Crime Network and this is one of those that I urge you to, uh, especially when he, Richard Merritt, takes the stand uh, because it's just you have to see the whole thing. I'm just like, oh my god, like uh, how do people like this exist, right? Uh, I've just taken the clips out so again refer to Law and Crime Network if you want to see the whole thing. Thing. Now, let's talk about the most important person in this, and that's the victim, Shirley. Shirley Merritt, the victim, was 77 years old at the time of her death. She was the defendant's very own mother. Now, if Shirley Merritt were alive today, she would have just celebrated her 50th Mother's Day as the defendant's mother. And during the course of this trial, you are going to learn a lot about Shirley. And I think that the theme that you will see is that she was somebody who was always giving of herself. Can you imagine 77 years old after all you've done for your son? And this is the thanks that he gives you. Those final moments of her life were spent with this realization, with this devastation. And we're going to learn more about Shirley through the story of what took place. You're going to see how much she did for him, how she made everything in his life possible, and then he literally just threw it back in her face. It was never enough for Richard Merritt, but it was never ever going to be enough, no matter what she did. Now, the defendant had been an attorney here in the Atlanta area, and it was Shirley who gave him the funds to set up his own practice. On the outside, everything looked fine for the defendant. He was married to his wife, Janine, who is a veterinarian here in town. He had two kids, both of whom were in private school, and he had his own law practice. He was in court in Cobb County all the time. See, he had it all. A family, a mother who helped him get all this stuff to achieve the success. You can only imagine the horror and disdain for Shirley when she learned that the very practice she helped her son achieve was one that he used to rip off numerous people in their own community. But it was discovered that he had violated the trust of his mother, of his wife, of his kids, and of many of his clients. Starting sometime in 2014-15, several of his clients started coming out of the woodwork, reporting that he was stealing from them. Cobb County investigated the charges and found that he had, in fact, stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars and defrauded many of his clients, most of whom we're elderly. It's so eerie how similar to the Alec Murdoch case this is. The deception, the deceit, the scandal. And just like Alec Murdoch, this would cause his life to crash. But here's the thing with personalities like this that we've learned. They don't want to walk away. They can't lose. They have to win at all costs. Cobb County and entered a guilty plea to all 34 counts on the Cobb County indictment. The judge sentenced him to 15 years to serve. Um, and for some reason, the judge decided to give him two weeks before he had to turn himself into the jail. He gave him two weeks to get his affairs in order before spending 15 years in the Department of Corrections custody. And this is the thing we'll, we'll talk about later as we get into it, that fatal decision that the judge made to let him go for two weeks. And we'll get into my opinion about these criminals who are allowed to have the luxury and the privilege of getting ready for prison. And then stuff like this happens, right? Now, I'm sure the judge wasn't expecting him to do this. He had shown no violent tendencies in his past to this level, right? Uh, so I'm not blaming the judge, but again, more like the system of it, because I just don't feel like some people should be afforded the luxury to go get ready for prison, uh, you know, just because their crime was, you know, a little bit better than some other crime or however you want to spin it, right? Um, but let's continue. The defendant, in the meantime, never turned himself in 
to the Cobb County Jail at 5 o'clock, by 5 o'clock on February 1st. And by this time, he was gone. In the wind not to be found until a nationwide manhunt uncovered him in Nashville, Tennessee, eight months later. And we're going to talk about what he did during that period of time, during the course of the trial, and I'm going to get back to that in a few minutes. But let's go back. Now use the clip we just watched as like a brief outline of what he did and what he was doing. Keep these bullet points in mind and we'll revisit them as we go along because it's next level and there's so many more details to it and he literally has an excuse for every last detail that is absurd the medical examiner found that she had been stabbed four times in the back one time in the side she had been stabbed under the right clavicle in the neck which severed her jugular and caused her to bleed out she was stabbed several times in the face, and the force was so strong, ladies and gentlemen, that the blade of that nine-inch knife lodged into the bones in her skull and the hand broke off. And this is just some of what happened to Shirley, okay? And I want you to keep in mind, when Richard takes the stand and we watch the clips and we hear all the stuff that was do going on, all the stuff he was doing, this new life he lived, this is how his mother's life was ended. This was personal. This was rage. Investigators arrived on the scene, and it was very clear to them that this had not been a case where an intruder came into the house and killed Shirley Mary. There were no open or broken windows. All the doors were closed. There was no sign of forced entry or any tampering at all. All the furniture was upright. There were valuables that had not been stolen. In fact, Shirley Merritt's purse was still on the scene and it had blank checks in it. <clears throat> Again, keep this in mind as we listen to the story that comes out. He would have you think that literally the stars and sun and moon aligned perfectly once in a millennium for the events that took place at his home on February 1st that he had nothing to do with. Where was the defendant all this time? Well, he went into hiding, but he wasn't hiding under a rock. He drove off out that day, um, and he went, we don't know where he went, but we know where he ended up. He went to Nashville, Tennessee, and he started a whole new life. Side note, I love how the state tells the story. I love the emotion. It's authentic. I believe it. Because literally with a case like this, it's hard to not have some kind of emotional reaction to it, whether it's sadness, horror, anger, frustration. I mean, all these things, right? Especially if you've dealt with... I don't know if he's a narcissist or a sociopath or I don't know what's wrong with him, okay? But he ain't right, okay? Um, there's so much going on with him and you'll see this come out when he's on the stand. You know, with just this like flat affect and everything. And so for a case like this, I just feel like the, the state is doing such an excellent job at the way she is telling the story, getting the facts across, and preparing us for the literal ridiculous excuses that Richard is going to offer as to what happened to his mother on that day. He was arrested 10 months, eight, I'm sorry, eight months later on September 30th of 2019 by um, Gerard Hunt and his team with the U.S. Marshals Office after a nationwide manhunt. You know how, you know how they found him? He was driving. Shirley Merritt's Lexus that he had stolen from her garage after he killed her. It never ceases to amaze me the levels of stupidity that we see in these cases oftentimes. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm glad we see them because it's what leads to them getting caught. But here's my thing, you do this next level thing, you don't turn yourself in, you have a cut an ankle monitor, you take your mother's life in a horrendous way, you steal her car to the point where you're, you're, a nationwide manhunt's out for you, and that's the car you keep driving?
I mean, make it make sense. Now, let's take a moment and look at what Richard's defense has to say. I've taken out a couple of clips because just like there's only a couple of clips here, they ain't had much to say about this. Okay. And that is what the truth demands. Now, I expect over the next few days that the state will come before you just as it has today and focus your attention on the things that they want you to see. They will funnel you to the facts that they want to present. They will focus your attention on the narrow time frame at the end of January 2019 and the beginning early days of February 2019. So literally, there is very little that the defense has to work with, right? I mean, except for poking holes in the story. But literally what she is describing the state doing is all that they can do. It's the only tactic that they can use because, again, if Richard's telling his defense team, this is what happens, I'm not budging from that story. This is how, like, this is how it has to go. Well, I mean, what can they do, right? They, they have to go with us. So I feel for them in this. During the time, you took money from your clients. Now, what the state will try to distract you from is those individuals a part of that case. That case involved a number of, of families and people who had money taken from them. It involved individuals who were upset understandably. They were angry. They had their, their lives altered, their dreams taken from them, and they were angry. This story sound familiar? Because it should. It's a page right out of the Alec Murdoch case that we reviewed recently. Blame the families, blame the victims of his first crime. They were upset. You know, they came back for a vengeance and that kind of thing. Anything but their client. But again, I get it. They only can work with what they have. And they ain't got nothing to work with. And he lost his bar license. And he signed up for a lengthy prison sentence. We are not trying to deflect from that. He admitted to that. But the state will try to draw your attention to that and not the individuals and the circumstances and the atmosphere that Mr. Merrick and his family were going through. A page right out of the Murdoch defense. Admit to wrongdoing on one thing to like gain trust, believability, that type thing, and hopes to get out of trouble over here. Of course they're going to be, you know, saddling up to, yep, he 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 signed up for that. He admitted he did wrong because you can't change that. It's already done, right? So you can only use it to your advantage, right? We've seen this. And it often makes me wonder when we see things like this. You know, I'm just like, okay, the Alec Murdoch trial, that was all over, right? You know every defense attorney and state everybody was paying attention to that trial. And so it makes you wonder do they help form some of their tactics by watching other trials i'd be curious if any actual lawyers and whatnot are watching um or trial attorneys to uh drop in the comments uh you know to help form that but also you know defendants have to be watching some of the stuff or keeping tabs on it and using that too because it just seems like he literally ripped off alec murdoch's you know perceived or you know suggested defense but that will not be found. You will have no forensic evidence implicating Mr. Merritt in this murder. Sometimes no forensic evidence is worse than forensic evidence, right? I mean, it can be just as damning because it's like, why aren't there fingerprints on this object that everybody uses all the time type thing. Now, let's take a look at when Mr. Richard takes the stand. Let's get to the meat and potatoes of this video, okay? Now, here's the thing. So Richard will get on the stand and he will do the first part, obviously, with his own defense. He will go on and ramble and ramble and try to garner sympathy and stall and I don't know what he's doing. Okay, but it gets to the point where the state is like, look, we, we can't, we're falling asleep over here. Somebody please help us. It's like just a plain old fashioned narcissistic rambling event. And we're gonna watch a few of the highlights of it. Now, while you were in undergrad, mm -hmm. did you meet a certain lady? I met a certain lady. Her name was uh, Janine Minicosi. I met Janine when she was a freshman and I was a junior. Father-son trips, we went on trips with other dads and their sons that we were friends with. Um, I went to all of his school activities, helped coach his baseball team, 
uh, helped out with, uh, with football. Um, as I said, it, it was those big things that brought us closer, but it was the little things as well. I laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, we were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. We walked around the REI Sporting Goods store because we both enjoyed outdoor things together. Jack, these have become very, very non-responsive. Um, I just asked that he answer the question and not go beyond that. Mr. Mayor, you need to confine your responses to the questions that are asked. If you don't understand the question, ask that it be clarified. Yes, sure. Honor. Cannot roll my damn eyes hard enough. It's giving Scott Nelson. It's giving Nancy Brophy. It's giving Daryl Brooks. I mean, I was like, thank God the state spoke up, right? Like, come on. On, you know they are sitting over there rolling their eyes in the back of their head, right? And this is the whole thing when these kind of situations happen because we see it. It's such a pattern. It's so interesting. I swear to God, I need to go back to school for like criminal psychology or forensic psychology or something because it fascinates me to no end. So here he is. We've seen this in so many behaviors, right? Where they get up here and I guess they just think they can talk their way out of it. Like, what else have I got to lose? I've talked my way out of everything in life. I'm going to talk my way out of this too. But they never stop to look at how ridiculous it is, right? I'm just like, oh my god. So, there's that. Let's get to the actual story. Now, again, this is between him and his defense. So these are very softball, you know, back and forth kind of questions. But let's hear from this side what happened. Now, in, did you go to jail that day? No, I did not. When were you report to the judge? The judge was gracious enough to give me two weeks to report, which would be February 1st by 5 p.m. at the Cobb County Jail. And he made it abundantly clear what would happen if I did not show up. What would happen if you didn't show up? If I did not show up, he would revoke my sentence and it would be a serve 30 sentence, which could affect, it could affect parole and all sorts of other things. So the sentence would be much harsher if I did not appear as scheduled and ordered. And there you go. So remember as we are watching this that he's on the stand at this point fighting for his life and his world, right? And he is going to try and make it sound like, you know, I had no choice. I, I, I mean, why would I run? The judge, the sentence he would give me was going to be so harsh. I, I didn't want to run. I had no choice. It was out of my control. We could be on the road by 2, no later than 2.30. It was, I believe, Super Bowl weekend, Friday afternoon traffic, a bunch of stuff going on in Atlanta. And, you know, obviously we don't want to be late to the jail, given the importance of me being on time. I was walking from the kitchen. I had just left the kitchen from keeping her company while she was making the spaghetti when I heard a very loud knock at the front door. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. The fact that there was not an audible sigh throughout the courtroom, I have to commend everyone in there, right? When the story starts unfolding, you're like, really? This is, we're, we, we've, we're suffering through this. Okay, Richard, keep talking. Now, here's the thing. I was just in Atlanta, so I can attest to the traffic statement. I'll give him that much. That much is true. I love how he slid in the fact that he was in there keeping mother company while she made me my last meal. And, you know, that's what we were doing. And then these men knocked at the door. Now, here's my thing, because, again, often with personality types like this, there's truth mixed in with their fictionalized version of reality so i have no doubt that she was making him this meal it was still there when her body was found so that much we know is true i truly wonder what was going on in those final moments because i would probably wage that they were having an argument of him wanting to run or do something like that. It, it, to me, it goes two ways. They're either having some kind of argument where he loses it and ends up doing what he did, or he's being completely normal, 
acting like everything's fine because he in his mind has already planned this. But then the amount of rage that comes out in the killing, it's like, that's what makes me think maybe there was an argument beforehand where he was like, mom, I'm going to run. And she, no, you got to go do your time. Almost like she was going to be the barrier of she wanted him to do the right thing because she would have. The evidence shows that Shirley was a lady of high moral or whatever you want to call it. Like, she was a decent lady, right? Um, she was not cool that he ripped off all the clients to begin with, so to run or, you know, go on the lam or whatever, absolutely not. Uh, but that's what it makes me think. But then also, here we go down the rabbit hole. Two men at a door, opens it up. He, there are pistols in their hands. Let's see what falls out of his mouth next. And they told me to let them in. So what'd you do? I let them in. I had never seen these guys before, and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. I let them in, they shut the door. Uh, about this time, my mother came to the foyer where I was standing with these two individuals, and they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. Remember that part in Silence of the Lambs where they're talking about Hannibal, how he killed a nurse, and they're like, he was hooked up to some kind of like monitor or whatever at the time, and they're like, his pulse never got above a whatever. This guy completely reminds me of that, right? Because the way he just sits there and is like completely calm recounting the story, like going on and on. This is the part that makes me think maybe he was sitting there just having a normal conversation with his mother and it was like, and then he was like, well, I guess it's time now. The meal's almost done and got up and like got the first weapon, you know, kind of a thing. Um, this guy scares the bejesus out of me. So did you go to the basement? The taller of the individuals, he was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built, walked past me, put the gun at my mother's lower back, and she started to head towards the stairway to the basement. The fact they said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. The younger of the men, he's probably about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, shoulder-length brown hair, pudgy, he put his gun on my back and we followed them. She opened the stair door to the basement, flicked on the light. It was a two-step two process to get down those stairs. You had four or five steps that went down, there's a landing, and then you make the turn, and there's the longer flight of stairs. So many details. So many extra details. It's almost like he wants to make the story believable by providing a bunch of extra details that no one asked for. Now, as we hear the story unfold and continue to unfold through his mouth with the defense and then through his mouth through the state, who she is not patient with him, uh, keep in mind, just listen to the absurdity of it. I open the door up for two strangers. And remember, this is all happening conveniently hours before he's to turn himself in. I open the door up for two strangers. They come go right to the mother, right? Like, she is the focal point, you know? I, I mean, again... It's just like, this guy has got a good imagination. I'll give him that much. They proceeded first. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps, by this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing he told her to shut the F up and pushed her down the stairs. And then what happened to your mother? It was the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, she plunged headlong into the wall. It's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. And I could tell that there was a dent or a hole in the wall. She was trying to get up and move around, but from my vantage point, she appeared like she couldn't get her balance. My God, Richard, down the stairs? Poor, poor Shirley. I can't imagine. 
He's literally describing the final moments of his mother's life at his hands. I think the way, like when he's sitting here like looking at no one in particular, I think he's recounting what he was doing to his mother. You know, I have no doubt that he can vividly remember that and the brutality of the murder. How would you forget that? Now, he led her down there probably cussing her out the whole way. She probably is making these ways. She's probably coming to the realization of, oh my God, like what's going on? But never even thinking possibly that my son's gonna kill me, right? I mean, because who's gonna think that? And this is another part, I go back and forth. You can tell that this is like really what's been like in my head about this as to how the final moments of her life played out. Like, was there an argument? Was he calm about it? At what point did it all, you know, go this way? And did, was he trying to get her to let him go? Or was she always going to be in his way? And he was like, no, absolutely not. Because if you also look at that, why would he even consider at like, mom, let me have your car and I'm going to leave. Like, really? Like, she's not going to, she's going to turn him in. So it was like, she was always going to be in his way. But keep that in mind as he talks about things, especially when we listen to him towards the end, talk about his children or whatnot. He tries to make it out like he has empathy, compassion, but the evidence of the brutality of what he did to his own mother completely shows otherwise. Was your mother injured at that time? She certainly appeared to be. And as I moved like I was going to try to go down the stairs, the guy dug the pistol into my back and grabbed my shoulder. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs put his pistol behind his back into the, the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35 pounds weight that has been seen during the course of this trial. He dug the pistol into my back. Now keep that in mind because this is like the most of an injury that he is going to sustain during this whole interaction. And that's also what's so bizarre about it is he has pieced together an excuse for every single bit of evidence. And we'll hear when more testimony comes out about letters that he wrote to his family creating excuses for why his fingerprints would be on stuff. I mean, he literally has put so much energy into that. If he had only put the same energy and did not ripping off his clients and being an honest man, surely would still be here. And he wouldn't have destroyed many people's lives, including his own at the end of it. Well, <laughs> the knife came later. Um, this monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. They shoved me over to the tile where the dumbbell rested. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. I, I cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand what would be the purpose because she wasn't moving. Why is any of this happening? It was a complete and utter nightmare. This monster took a dumbbell and bludgeoned my mother right in front of me. Golly jeepers, it was the worst thing I've ever seen. I mean, that's the emotion you're getting out of him. He has no affect describing this whatsoever. It's like he is trying to muster up a little bit of emotion in the beginning where he's like, well, the knife came later. And I'm like, and again, I think he's just going back over what he did, right? Because he has to match the story up somehow. So he's going to take his actions and project them onto something else. So what did you do? There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. He put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me and he pulled out his cell phone. 
and he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping Mia off at her school, a picture of Jack being dropped off or picked up at Lovett, a picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta, and a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic in Bindings. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. Notice how he is repeating things that the state said that they brought up. The knife in the face, I mean, that's horrifying, right? So he's bringing that to attention. He's acting like incredulous about, you know, the whole thing. And then he goes in for the big whammy. Now remember, he has to come up with an excuse for everything that happened to the mother, to him, and to why he left and started a new life. They showed me the pictures of my wife and kids and threatened them. Now, there's two versions. If this happened to normal people, there would be a reaction to this, but then somebody who's making it up is who we're dealing with and his feigned reaction because none of it will make sense. And the behaviors that he displayed and actions that he took after that just keep getting next level to where it's like, dude, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even make sense. The things that he did and is now trying to play them off. And then they left. And then, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Why not? Because I just witnessed an unimaginable act of violence. Two unimaginable acts of violence. And then a man coldly look at me after he's standing over the body of my dear mother that he skewered and bludgeoned and shows me pictures of my family. So no, I did not call the police. How much longer did you say that? No, I didn't call the police. What are you, crazy? I fled to Nashville and shacked up with a new girlfriend. What else did you think I would do? Now notice how he keeps saying my dear mother, my dear mother over and over like it's going to sway the jurors. And also notice how he acts in sense of the idea that he would even call the police, right? Now remember, he most likely already reviewed these questions with his attorney. So keep that in mind. Like you're seeing two versions of acting going on. Acting, but then acting, acting. You know what I mean? Because he already knows these. So he's having to put on this face of like, no, why, why, why would I do that? I stood there numb and incapable of moving for what seemed like minutes. These guys had left. I went upstairs. All I could think about was Janine and the kids and what these monsters could do. And I went and got a small backpack out of my room. I put a few, few clothes, I didn't pack much, some basic toiletries, and I left. Mm -hmm. All I could think of with the kids. I mean, seriously. I love types like this who will utilize their kids or family when it's convenient. Oh, I did for the kids. We are the world. But y'all are the children. You know, they'll do that when it suits their needs. But it also makes you wonder, well, were you thinking of the kids and family when you were ripping off the community and possibly, you know, creating a situation where you go away for a long time, which is what happened? I don't think he was thinking of them then. Um, why did you take your mother's car? I took my mother's car because it had more gas in it than my car. It had a bigger tank. And I had no idea where I was going or where I was going to end up. And it seemed to me in that state of mind that at least her car would be easier to sleep in. And that's why I took her car. I mean, it has an excuse for everything, but these type personalities always do. Now, on the surface level, pretend like this really did happen, right? Like, it legit happened the way he said. It would be then reasonable 
to be like, oh, mom's keys are here. I'm going to grab her keys, take the car, and go straight, like, to the cops, to wherever. Wherever I can go to to get help, right? But that's in the notion that this really happened and, like, maybe to a normal person. Because, again, a normal person would maybe either just call the cops or something, right? Or first foremost, call your wife and kids and be like, you're in danger. Go to a police station right now. Like, I like, don't do anything like I'm getting cops to you. But again, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with Richard Merritt. How much time did it take to get to Nashville? Is that where you go? Did you go straight to Nashville? No, no, I didn't go all the way to Nashville in one one shot. Um, no, I I ended up going to the QT station at Indian Trail in 85. I stopped to get a couple of bottles of water, some snacks. Um, I only had $18 cash on me. Um, I topped off the tank, I believe, put some gas in it, and then I proceeded towards towards Cobb County, towards 285, and then ultimately to 75. Now, keep in mind, there is video evidence of him going to this QT station. Now, that would have been a perfect spot. There's a like hundred others before he got there, but again, all else fails, you get to the QT station, you call the cops, you go in, you slip the worker a note, something, right? But again, this is, you know, not who we're dealing with. Now, also, again, keep in mind, he's acting like his memory is foggy a bit, like, oh, I think I topped the tank off. He's acting this way to gain trust. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, I think I did this. He 100% knows what's on that video. He 100% knows what he did. And he 100% is just faking all this to seem more believable. Why you put your monitor up? Well, the reason I cut my monitor off is I was concerned by the time I got north of Cobb County, you know, I was within, I believe, an hour or so of when I was supposed to report. I had no idea if just by routine the monitoring people were watching me or not. So that's why I headed towards Cobb County. I didn't want to do anything that would get me involved with the police because I didn't want it to come back to hurt my family if these guys found out and thought I had said something. And there you have it, folks, the big ask. He's asking you to believe this whole line of BS he just spewed. I'm surprised there wasn't audible laughs in the courtroom. He cuts his monitor off for fear of getting the cops involved because he was afraid of the big mean pretend guys going after his family. I mean, you can't make it up. I mean, but you can because he did and it's like that stupid. Now, he didn't want to flee and start a new life. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. He was excited about reporting to jail. That's what he wanted to do. So he literally cut the device off that would have called the cops and gotten him help through the situation. It gets more absurd from here. By the time I actually got there. And why did you stay in Nashville? Nashville is a big city. I had no more money to buy gas. And it seemed like a safe place to pull off and park and try to figure out what in the world was going on. So he basically drove the car until he ran out of gas, which just happened to be in a big city, Nashville. And so that's where he started a new life over. Okay, got it. And eventually did you get a job in Nashville? Yes, I got a job at a, at a bar uh, called Betty's Bar and Grill on the west side of Nashville. Imagine pulling some next level stuff like this and then being ballsy enough to go get a job somewhere. I mean, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. And you heard yesterday, well, last week from um, Kelly Richardson. And how'd you meet Kelly? I met Kelly online. And did you start living with Kelly? Fairly quickly, yes. Yes. Not even killing his own mother could keep him from swiping right on Miss Kelly. I can only imagine 
what she thought when all this came out. And I'll say this, I bet he was the most agreeable boyfriend ever, right? <laughs> he was like, honey, whatever you like, I love that too, okay? He needed a place to live and he needed a roof over his head and meals and whatnot and Kelly was going to be his ticket. Did she know who you were? No, she did not. And why did you tell her? I did not tell her because Again, in my mind, with how horrific the events of my mother's murder were, how graphic the people were capable of such insane violence, I had to believe that they would keep their word and take it out on my ex-wife and my children if anything was said. So I adopted a new identity and I made a vow to myself that I would never reveal who I was. Because he needed three hots and a cot, right? Just like I said, Lord knows he has signed up for those for the rest of his life. And the car was gone. Kelly lived in an attic apartment in an old house on 18th Avenue um, near the university. And I didn't know it, but apparently there were a lot of break-ins. And um, learned after the fact that the car had been broken into, and during investigation of it by the Vanderbilt police, the car got towed, and that's what ultimately led to my capture. So I woke up, walked out, the car was gone. Now remember, he kept his mother's car, he did put stolen tags on it. I mean, seriously, again, cannot roll my eyes hard enough at it, but again, thank God he did, because it brought him to justice. The only thing that could top that off is if the car had gotten towed from a Walmart parking lot. Richard, getting back to February 1st. Yes. Did you kill your mother? Absolutely not. I loved my mother. She stood by me. I'm not a violent person. Never laid a finger on anybody. Well, I mean, he said he didn't do it, so, I mean, what do y'all think? Should we just let him go? We're sorry we wasted your time, Richard. Now, enough with all this softball back and forth between him and the defense. It's time to see someone get up there and rough him up and ask him the hard-hitting questions. Let's hear how it goes when the state gets a hold of him. It's entirely possible. I have no idea what vehicle they were in. Okay, and a safe place to go would have been the Cobb County Jail, which you drove right past on 75 North. Is that correct? The instructions were, and I took them at their word based on what they did to my mother, don't say a word to anyone. The last place to go would be to somewhere like the Cobb County Jail. And why is that? Well, you have law enforcement there. If they have people in Cobb County, they know a report. I'm more likely to say something because I'm in the safety of the jail. That made no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, so you didn't make any calls to anybody to warn them that their lives were in danger, right? These gentlemen told me, and I use gentlemen very sarcastically, these monsters told me, don't say a word to anyone. After what they did to my mother, I didn't say a word to anyone. Okay, well, there is a lot of things to talk about here. Okay, first things first, notice how he corrects himself when he calls him gentlemen. He says, I'm saying that very sarcastically. Like he almost let it slip, the lie, right? Well, these gentlemen said this, and I'm saying that very sarcastically. Like, why would you even say that, right? Also notice how she calls him out on this. We talked about this earlier, where she's like, and you didn't call anybody to warn them. And he just keeps going back to, I took these guys at their word. I took these guys at their word. This is the part that doesn't make sense because again, a normal person who had this happen, there there would be something going on. You wouldn't just say, okay, well, they told me to go away and never come back again. How convenient, right? On the day you're supposed to turn yourself in for 15 years, right? I mean, come on. Like, it's so laughable. And honestly, when I was looking at the, I forget what they're called, the court reporter, the person doing the funky little machine there, I was like, I, I knowing me, and how I will laugh at things like when you're not supposed to, like in those moments, like it's how I deal with, you know, difficult things or whatever. I was like, oh, there's no way I could not just bust out, keep from busting out laughing in this. It's that over the top. Yeah, that made no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, so you didn't make any calls to anybody to warn them that their lives were in danger, <laughs> right? These gentlemen told me, and I use gentlemen very sarcastically, these monsters told me don't say a word to anyone. After what they did to my mother, 
I didn't say a word to anyone without qualification. Okay, so these monsters, do you think that they were the same people who had been chasing your house starting at the beginning of January? Well, they sure knew we had a basement right off the road. Okay, and how many times had people driven off around the cul-de-sac, or driven around the cul-de-sac, as you testified earlier? Suspiciously, at least 20 or 30 times by my count. 20 or 30 times? Did you ever get any of their tag numbers? It would have been possible to run out there in the dark and get their tag numbers. Did you ever call the police to say, oh my gosh, somebody is following me? Did you Actually, ever do that? Actually, my mother and I did discuss it. You discussed it, but you never called the police, and you never made a report of people casing your house or running around the, the cul-de-sac in their cars, right? No, we didn't. Did you ever talk to any of the neighbors about what was going on? Uh, I didn't. I can't say if my mother did or not. Now, notice how he will try and play this off on the person that can't verify any of it, his mother who died at his hands. Now, the state is asking him common sense questions that anyone in this scenario, if you rewind up to, you know, before all the events took place of the death of his mother, the murder of his mother, if you're going based on what he said, 20 or 30 suspicious cars, well, why not get their tags? Well, I couldn't catch the tags in time. Okay, I'll give you that. Wouldn't you have a ring doorbell at this point? Wouldn't you have video cameras? Why not do something? Why not contact police, do extra patrol, reach out to someone, but there's no evidence of that because he never did because he's making it up. Um, so these two, you call them monsters, right? Yes. You've never seen these guys in your life? Never. And they were both kind of big. You said one was pudgy. What about the other one? He was athletic and thin. Okay, and could you describe what they were wearing? Yes, I can. What was that? The athletic thin one was wearing sort of a black thermal long sleeve top and what looked like dicky khaki pants. Okay, and what kind of gun was he holding? Could you see? I'm not a gun guy, but it was a semi-automatic, sort of like the police have. It was right. not a revolver. What color was it? It was black. Again, what a photographic memory he has, right? And notice how she's talking to him. She's talking to him like you would talk to a child who's lying about their hand being in the cookie jar with said hand still in the cookie jar. So you got a knock on the door after being followed or having people suspiciously drive around your neighborhood for several weeks, right? Yes. And this was the day that you were supposed to turn yourself into the jail. Yes, it was. And you looked out the window, right? I did. And you saw that there was a guy all in black, right? I didn't say he was all in black. A black shirt and dicky pants. He was wearing a black top, that was it. And a guy wearing a camouflage hoodie, right? And blue jeans. Yeah. And you had never seen these guys before, but you decided to answer the door. I opened the door. I had, we don't, we did not have a peephole in the door. It was not uncommon to just open the door could have been a neighbor could have been anybody i certainly didn't expect that in the middle of the day just like she said with all the stalking the suspicious activity people are out for you and you're gonna just open the door for people who it sounds like you know oh i didn't know who they were and one was wearing a, a hoodie that they that they always have to say that they're wearing a hoodie right or something along those lines why would you open the door why would you open it it doesn't even make sense and this is the part where i'm like did you not, and obviously you can't run the story by somebody, but it's like, what, at what point did you think this was even believable? Like, why would you even do that? It doesn't even make sense. Even on a normal, pretend you didn't have the stuff going on, most people are not going to open their front door at this point in time, or they have ring cameras or something, right? It doesn't make sense, but if you were having to look over your shoulder and you had this kind of stuff going on, you're certainly not going to open the door for just any some random person that knocks on it. Um, and you wrote letters while you were in custody for this offense, is that correct? Yes. You wrote many, many letters to your friends and family members, correct? Uh, mainly family members, yes. Okay, specifically you wrote letters to Jean. Yes. And you wrote letters to your brother Rob? Yes. Okay. And you told them that it wouldn't be unlikely that your fingerprints would be on that knife, correct? From the standpoint that we all used the knives in the kitchen, I lived in the house, it... it very well could be on there. I All don't right. know. 
Now, his older brother didn't buy this either, right? I mean, it's hard to. Of course, he's going to write letters to try and cover his tracks. It's what these personality types do. These personality types are excellent at covering their tracks. The process of it, I should say. But it doesn't mean that they're good at executing it. You know what I mean? Because just like this, okay, excellent, I'm going to write this letter, I'm going to come up with reasons why this and that, blah, 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 but they can never quite pull it off. Did, did you uh, tell him um, <laughs> any fingerprints that may exist are easily explained um, as the dumbbells were mine? Did you tell him that? Yes, I did. And I regularly use the knife in question to prepare food, correct? Yes, I did. Um, and you said you worked out three to four times per month and you were living there for 10 months, so it would not be hard to explain that evidence away if it were to appear. Like I just said, they're good at the idea of how to cover tracks, but they're just really, really bad about it and making it seem believable, right? If somebody wrote a letter to me like that from jail saying about their fingerprints on the dumbbell, immediately guilty immediately guilty immediately guilty i mean come on you just you can't make this stuff up you never you, you did take so you said you took your mother's car right yes. and you took your mother's phone as well right yes i did and um that that doesn't make really a lot of sense can you explain why you took your mother's phone i took my phone, of course, and I took her phone because of all the calls we had been getting on both my phone and her phone. I assumed that these were the same folks who had been calling us that had killed her. They might have some sort of demands. Janine might call my phone or my mother's phone if these guys made a move on her or the kids. And I wanted to know exactly what was going on. That's why I took both phones. The key ingredient here is he wanted to know what was going on, but he also omitted a word from that. Control. He wanted to control what was going on. Uh, why would you take your mother's phone under the premise that he is sane? Why wouldn't you call your ex-wife and warn her about herself and children? There's so many why would you do this? It's literally to the point where I'm like, why would you get on the stand with the story? It is so utterly flimsy. And again, I just revert back to, because this is part of the psychological part that interests me with this, is the fact where I'm like, he can't believe this. I mean, this is literally what I'm thinking in my mind. He can't believe his own story. There's literally no way. But again, I'm like, he must just be used to and him and these other personality types of just talking their way out of things. Because oftentimes, if you've dealt with someone like this in your lifetime, you know how it's like, you end up dealing with them in such a way that you're just pandering to them to shut them up or get them out of your life or make them go away. And they get used to that. They get what they want that way. And so I'm like, maybe he thought that he could just annoy everybody to the point of, you know, a not guilty verdict. I don't know. You went to Nashville. Is that the first place you went? Or did you stop anywhere else along the way? I believe I stopped in Chattanooga to use the bathroom at a Walmart. Okay. I'm just interrupting your regularly scheduled programming to point out that yes, we finally have a Walmart in the case. It's just like clockwork. Yes. All right, because it says here that you were born on February 25th of 1980, right? Correct. When actually your birthday is February 23rd, 1974. That's right. Okay, so you subtracted six years on your age because you didn't want to get caught. I did not want to get found and have my family hurt as a result. I was okay. trying to disappear to protect them. All right, um, but you did go on to a dating app and meet women on that, right? Yes. I mean, can't roll my eyes hard enough, y'all. Someone give me a damn gavel and slam it down. Case closed, guilty. I love how she served and swerved this man right here. You know, oh, you didn't want to get caught. Well, I didn't want to get found out and risk my family. But you went on a dating app. Well, yeah, I did. I mean, you can't say anything to it. It is so utterly absurd. 
I mean, it's literally like Daryl Brook level of shit. Like, he's not given the shenanigans that Daryl Brook did in court. I'll give him that. He's more like, obviously, mannerly and stuff. But the absurdity of his story is just... I don't know if I've heard one this bad. Um, but you put those stickers on your mother's car as part of this persona of Mick Malvo. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so that was part of the deception. Is that right? I would call it protection. All right. And you also put a stolen license plate on your mom's car. This is true. I did. All right. So that was part of the lie as well because you didn't want to be found by these monsters. Deception, protection, it's all the same, right? Can we please take a moment to talk about his fake name, Mick Malvo? And he made himself younger. <laughs> I mean, he was ready to go. He was ready to rumble. And I mean, went straight to Tinder, but it shows you this, I mean, this guy had a law license, y'all. This is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous man even before you get to the obvious thing that he did to his mother but i mean when you look at the crime th those crimes he committed to get into this situation to the fraud and stuff pff, uh, honey that's a, a a cakewalk for him this man was capable of anything obviously no it wasn't true you you didn't have any cousins or family in nashville not to my knowledge no okay and so you didn't really have a place to stay in nashville not at first no okay until you met kelly Correct. So you were using her for a place to live. Is that right? I wouldn't go that far, no. Okay. Um, you told Kelly that you did not have any kids, correct? That's true. I and did. you said you had a niece, though, with cerebral palsy. I did. And you never said anything about um, any kind of nephew, right? No, I did not. You said that your mom had died of leukemia. Is that a lie that you told him? That's what I told her. Okay. Um, Kelly had to have been like, what in the hell have I gotten myself into? And you know he told her, as far as the leukemia thing goes, he was like, yes, it was very aggressive leukemia, leukemia. We're all still very devastated. I can really hardly talk about it right now without getting upset. In fact, the only thing I know that would make me feel better and heal my inner wounds is to move in with you, like, right now. Well, that would definitely lead to compromising my family, yes. All right. Mr. Merritt, when you originally stole money from your clients, you stole, what, about $500,000, more or less, right? Yes, correct. Um, and most of these clients were elderly. Not most of them, about a third. About a third, okay. Um, are you aware that the average age of the clients who are chart who are listed as your victims in the indictment is 61.2 years old? I wasn't specifically targeting the elderly. I believe the laws. Oh, come on. The devil is in the details. It was only one third. Who cares if the average age of the person was, you know, possibly close to retirement age where they're going to enjoy the rest of their life and he just destroyed it all. I mean, we should feel sympathy for him. Let's keep going. I really don't know the numbers, man. Okay, and they had been injured in car accidents and other kind of insurance claims. That's 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 kind of the meat of the folks that you were representing and that you stole from. Is that right? That's correct. And you would tell them you 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 would you would settle their claims with the insurance company and not tell the clients that you had settled, right? That's what I did. And so you would take their money from the insurance company and keep it as your own, right? Well, it would be put back into the firm for the most part, but yes. I mean, we really are talking about Alec Murdoch part two, right? And just like that case, Richard will try and minimize what he did. He'll try and scoot around, but he'll also try and leverage it for trust and whatnot for the current jury that he's sitting in front of. Okay, so the day of February 1st, 2019, these two guys came in. They killed your mother with her kitchen knife and your weight, right? Yes, they were my weights. And they um, didn't steal anything from the house. I don't know if they did or not. Okay, and um, they didn't break in. You said that you let them in yourself. 
No, I'm not aware that they tried to break in before. Okay, coming. and they had never tried to break in prior to that. I can't say who tried to break in at any given point. Okay. I don't know. Because nobody, as far as you know, had tried to break into your house prior to that. I'm not aware of anybody trying to break in, no. Okay. But they did not leave a scratch on you. They roughed me up a little bit going down the stairs, but no, they didn't. Okay. Well, they roughed me up a little bit, but literally desecrated my mother's body. I mean, come on. And the way that he talks, like, well, I don't know if they tried to break in previously. I don't know if they stole anything. Of course you know, because you're the one who took the, and the only stolen stuff from the house was what he took, right? Now, here is the thing. Oh, this back and forth, this long, drawn-out story. It brings us to the meat and potatoes of this trial. Was Richard able to sway the jury? Did they believe that two men were just let into the home, destroyed his mother's body and her life, and then forced him to take her car and go on the run and start a new life with Kelly in Nashville? Let's just see. Verdict form, as of count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count four, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count five, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count six, Possession of knife during commission of a felony. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. This 24th day of May, 2023. Didn't the guy reading the verdict sound like, I don't know if it's like Alexa or Google or like a, a phone operator voice where they're like, on count one, we, the jury, find you not guilty. Press one for crying or two for feigned anger. You know what I mean? And notice on that note where he was like, he took his glasses off, just... It's like, you know, again, I don't, even, I don't even know what that's for. I'm like, dude, you had to know this was coming, right? You had to know. There's no way this was a surprise. I mean, it took him, what, like two hours? I mean, again, this is one of those where I'm like, I'm sure they just went back there, took a poll... Just to see, I mean, they probably all got a good laugh in, like, but probably also just decompressing from the ickiness of him. Because to listen to a guy up there saying this story about the horrors that happened to his mother and trying to play it off, it's so disgusting. It is absolutely awful. Now, sentencing in this case was short and sweet and swift. But before we get to that, Richard did have a little something to say. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the whole thing, okay? Because you need to hear the whole thing, right? Um, we're going to play it in its entirety. I think it's like three minutes long, and then we're going to discuss afterwards. You know, I realize that words aren't going to adequately convey what has occurred throughout the past week and the previous several years. I was raised right by two very good people, beautiful people, my mother and father. I had a beautiful family that I've lost. I've long since lost them. I lost them in the Cobb County case. Things were never the same after the arrest. I had, as I said, a beautiful family, beautiful children, a beautiful wife, inside and out, all of them. The world was, was truly our oyster, and I blew it. Just fell victim to the ultimate drug there is, and that's the green drug money. And it led to just bad behavior and bad choices. And my life spiraled out of control, and I couldn't get it back. I am immensely sorry for the pain that this entire process has caused. I realize it's been very uncomfortable for my family, those who used to be my friends, extended family, everybody who ever cared about me. And I was blessed to have a lot of people that did. And most of them are gone now. Maybe they'll come back in my life one day. I don't know. I have to earn that back somehow. 
I accept the court's sentence, whatever it may be. I respect, despite how poorly I treated the profession I was so lucky to be a part of, I, I respect the system, I respect justice, and the jury's verdict. I certainly understand my rights of appeal and will pursue that accordingly, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. We all wish things could be different, but I can't go back and change anything. Um, as I said, I, I just, it's, it's a very surreal experience to be sitting here. And um, words aren't going to do any good. And I just want my family to know as as I sit here now, that I wish none of us had to go through it and endure the pain of this entire ordeal. And I hope that one day, when they're ready, if they're ready, that I'd be blessed to have them in some form of my life. I have not had a single interaction with either one of my children since being arrested in Nashville. I have no idea what their lives are like. I really have no idea what they look like, what their day-to-day -day life is like. And I know it's hard for a lot of people to believe this, but I, I do love them more than anything, and I miss them terribly. I'm not trying to interfere in their lives, and certainly that being a part of it, it's a little bit difficult in prison. I've been in prison now two and a half years. Before that, I was stuck in DeKalb County 14 months in COVID, so I've been incarcerated in almost four years. I know how hard it is, and I know how it changes people. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to be a better person and realize that life is a blessing, whatever form it may take, even a very difficult situation such as what I'm facing right now. I appreciate the court's time. I was raised by two good people and that's what makes it even worse is the fact that his mother gave him this life, helped him with this life, got him up and running all this type of stuff and this is what he did in his moments of desperation. I like that he acknowledged that he threw his life away and this whole thing feels like a low key apology for the murder. Now I get there are appeals and all that kind of stuff. I don't expect anyone to ever take accountability at this point. Now one thing that was interesting is towards the end he starts talking about his kids and he hasn't seen them and maybe they'll have something to do with him this and the other and I'm like you ran off after killing your mother and started a new life with a new wife not a wife but you know what I'm saying it just rammed a little bit you're ready to leave them all behind right you weren't gonna even I mean sayonara goodbye but now that you got caught you want to have a relationship with them I mean seriously you want them to come visit you and I'm sure later in life they will have questions, right? And it will be up to them because, again, these are victims. The children, the ex-wife, they're all victims of his actions, right? In addition to the numerous people that he ripped off and obviously his mother, so many people he has victimized in his actions from start to finish. So, again, notice where he also finishes off where he says, and the difficulties that are facing me. He never once says the horrible thing that happened to my mother. And I think that speaks volumes because I think he, I don't know, he seemed to have hated the woman. I mean, look at the crime that he did. You would think if this really went down, if it really went down, if somebody wanted to get back at him and kill the mother, to you know, be like, you're gonna have to live through this, they would have, number one, not done it in front of him. Number two, it would have been like an assassination, not this bludgeoning, crazy, you know, thing going on it just wouldn't have looked like this at all now let's see what happens for the sentence suspended consecutively on count six thank you mr merritt if you'll please stand sir mr merritt as to count one malice murder i do sentence you to life without the possibility of parole counts two and three will be vacated as a matter of law 
counts four and five will merge with count one. As to count six, possession of a knife during the commission of a felony, I do sentence you to five years to serve consecutive to the sentence in count one for a total sentence of life without parole plus five years. I will give you credit for the time that you served from September 30th of 2019 to the present. And Mr. Mayor, as I indicated previously, you are entitled to appeal your conviction in this case. You have 30 days from today's date to file your notice of appeal to preserve your appeal rights. Uh, Mr. Queen, can you assist him with doing that? We'll take care of it, Judge. All right. Mr. Mayor, do you have any questions about your appeal rights? No, you are. All right. If you'll have a seat. I love that she stacked the sentences and it's like life plus five. So he's going to be serving probation in the afterlife, wherever that might be. I imagine it will be somewhere very hot. Now, I also like that she's like, I'm going to give you credit for time served. Like that was like a little bit of like a salt in the wound type thing for him. Like, well, look, you've already done a couple of years. I mean, hell, you only got natural life and then, you know, five more years to do. I mean, my God. And the judge was just very like, you know what? I don't have nothing nice to say. I was curious to see if she was going to say anything, but it was just like, nope, here's your sentence. We're done. Because some of it to me, and I mean, every judge is different, but there's like this whole level of ridiculousness to this where it's like, just, I can't even entertain this. You know, it's like, this is absolutely just ridiculous that you have put all your family through this, killed your mother, victimized the community, and now you're going to get up here. It's like spitting on everyone's grave as far as I'm concerned. Now, one reason I wanted to share this with y'all and give my commentary on it is because, I mean, cases like this are kind of just, they're made for the sofa squad, let's be honest. I mean, his time on the stand was absurd, right? Uh, but also, it's so similar to the Alec Murdoch case. And again, I'll just reiterate it where I'm very curious to know, you know, if these, and we'll never know, right? Uh, if these <clears throat> defendants, if these perpetrators, if these criminals see other cases, like if he was watching the Alec Murdoch case and he basically, you know, got the story from that and ran with it. Um, I don't think the defense had anything to work with in this case at all. I thought the state did an excellent job in it. And obviously they got the conviction and they got justice for his mother who gave herself over to him literally her whole life, making his life possible but then in her final moments of you know having her own life taken from her at the age of 77 imagine you've made it through life to that age to this golden age that you were blessed to even still be here you know what I'm saying and your own blood takes your life over this because of something he did that's the absolute shocker to this. You know, again, my heart goes out to the survivors and my heart goes out to his children. I can't imagine having to grow up uh, in the shadow of this and with this. This is a defining thing for them. And for him to have the audacity to talk about them wanting to come see him and, you know, they have, have something to do with him. You know, and only time will tell that. These are wounds that I don't know if you could ever truly fully heal from them, but, I mean, one would have to. So... There's that. There's all of that that we just watched. Again, dying to know the Sofa Squad's comments. Did anyone believe the story? Does anyone? Yeah, I want to know. Not guilty out there. <laughs> this one was just, it was so over the top. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're still watching, drop some sofas for Roscoe. He's, well, be careful when you drop him because he's under the sofa, so we don't need to squish him. We don't need to squish him. But anyways, until we all gather around in the comment section to continue the absurd conversation, I'll see y'all there.